All right, we got this bad boy in the house. We got the Fujifilm X-H2 and I'm finally doing a review on this after using this for about three, four months. You already saw like comparison videos on, on it, uh, but there hasn't been an official review with this. Ugh. The Fujifilm X-H2, baby. Look at this bad boy. Look at this sexy ass camera right here, man. Such a look, good looking camera, such a sexy ass body. And over the past few months, I've been enjoying my time with this camera. I've shot some portraits. I've used it as my travel camera. I took some travel shots throughout the country of Portugal and I took it to one of the sunniest countries in the world. That's right, the United Kingdoms. And I'm ready to share my thoughts on this camera. Let's just start with what people want to hear and that is the image quality. I love the image quality coming out of this camera. The 40 megapixel sensor provides such a great amount of detail. I'm also loving the colors coming out of this camera. I don't know if it's just me or if it's just a placebo effect or it's just because like it's a mixture of the EVF and the LCD screen. But I was shooting with both the X-H2 and the X-S10 a few months back and both shot at the same film recipe, the nostalgic negative film recipe. So the settings are the same and as I was shooting both, I just find that the colors on the X-H2 to be a bit more pleasing. The colors just had this vibrancy and pop to it and the colors were rich, the skin tones look amazing and it got me super excited for the photos. Maybe it's a mixture of the sharp and bright EVF with this sensor, I don't know, but I just love it. <laughs> the 40 megapixel is nice, it's great for cropping your images, it's great if you want a little more reach in your photos, it's also great to recompose your image if you fail to get it right in camera the first time. It still leaves you with an image full of detail. Uh, I don't want to repeat myself because this 40 megapixel sensor was also in the X-T5 and I do echo the same thoughts and sentiment that I do here. So if you're thinking of getting the X-T5, or perhaps any upcoming camera with the 40 megapixel sensor inside, rest assured that it's awesome, it's, it's amazing. You have nothing to worry about. But how is it in a low light? So we've been told that the higher the megapixel counts, the worse the image gets in low light. When I did the low light uh, testing with X-T5, I found it to be not as bad as I thought it would. Noise patterns and how it looks is so subjective, so this is debatable. But from my testings, I find the noise and the transition to be finer and smoother in my opinion, uh, making it look aesthetically more pleasing than the 26 megapixel sensor. And I was also using this camera at nighttime in London and I honestly have no problems with low light performances. I think if you have a fast enough lens with some decent lighting, you can get away with some decent photos. But yeah, if you wanna check out that low light high ISO performances comparison where I did compare the X-T5 sensor to the X-S10 sensor, I'm gonna leave the details to that video down in the description below for you to check out. Let's move on to the pixel shift. Now, this is not something that I do, but I did try it like three times. And if you can find a use for it, by all means use it. But right now I just find that it's just a waste of time. I wish the camera did the pixel shift processing for us inside the in within the camera to create us one big file what the pixel shift actually does is it takes 20 raw shots by moving the ibis sensor around right to get to shift it around and then what you have to do is import that import the raws onto your computer download fujifilm's pixel shift combiner software and then you have to choose that file choose all the files and drag them onto the software and then have the software process it. and that just takes too many steps all that just seems like a waste of time to me and if you want to do a similar effect in a faster way i would suggest just going to uh, photoshop and then just open up the raw right click and then go to enhance photo and then you can click and with a click of a button just click the super resolution and then you can get 150 megapixels in a click of a button and instead of wasting all this time manually grabbing all the files and doing all that stuff uh, photoshop just seems like i did it in like 10 seconds if fuji made the process a bit more streamlined i would consider using uh, the pixel shift but to me right now it just seems like gimmick at the moment so i won't be using it let's move on to the video 8K, do you really need it? Absolutely not. You don't really need it. Everyone is just starting to hop onto 4K. People are still viewing their content on 1080p and, and a majority of people are viewing their content on their phones, which does not have a 4K mo monitor. Some phones do, but like the iPhones and the, the iPhones out there, they're all still using like a 1080p display 
or something just a little bit better. And again, not everybody has an 8K monitor to view 8K content. Not everybody has an 8K monitor to edit on, nor do they have an 8K TV to watch 8K content. So this 8K feature to me is hype for the most part, but it's great that it's there because it's future-proofing the camera. More modern cameras have 8K video features now. You got a couple of Sony cameras, the Sony A1 and the A7R5. You got the Nikon Z9 and you got the Canon R5 and the R5C. And now you have the X-H2. X-H2 is a part of that Cool Kids Club now as well. I tried the 8K video feature. It's great. I love how crispy and sharp it is. The only use I got of out of filming in 8K is to have that sh resolution to crop and reframe my shots in post in like a 4K timeline or even a 1080 timeline. I find it's very helpful and handy. But then again, when I didn't have 8K in my tool bag, I was still shooting in 4K like a normal person and I was setting up my shots and frame. There wasn't really a time where I'm like, hmm, I wish I could reframe this differently. Oh, if only I had 8K with me. To me, it doesn't make that much of a difference. If you, if you missed the shot, you missed your shot. If you missed your shot, you can reframe or get a different angle, different shot. So it's not the end of the world. So it just puts me in the conundrum. 8K is good, but if you rely on 8K to recompose all the time, you're just going to be lazy. Maybe that's just me though, or maybe I'm just looking too deep into this. Don't forget that you need like a powerful camera to edit 8K videos, otherwise you're computer will just bog you down from the 8k files the footage is good the colors are great out of this sensor it's amazing so you got the 4k 60 with a slight crop a 1.14 times crop the xh2s has no crop on 4k 60 i do like the 4k 60 on this camera but i still prefer 4k 60 footage on the xh2s but the xh2 4k 60 will get the job done and for most people they're probably not going to notice you also have other options that the xh2s does not have you have the ability to go a peg lower from 8k you are able to film in 6.2K up to 30. And then below that, there's 4K HQ, which uh, down samples from the 8K sensor to give you a crispy sharp footage. And below that, you got regular 4K. The X-H2 also has a digital zoom feature uh, in 4K because of its 8K sensor, only available in 4K HQ, 4K DCI, HQ and full HD. Uh, the rolling shutter performance on this camera is not the worst I've seen. I still give that to the Sony a7 IV. Because this camera doesn't have a stack sensor like the X-H2S, it is more prone to rolling shutter. Now, if you're a sensible filmmaker, video creator, I'm sure you can work around this. Just uh, don't be an idiot and whip this camera around everywhere. And I think this camera is gonna serve you just fine. But if you're someone that shoots a lot of fast paced stuff and you, you need to whip it around a lot, I don't think the X-H2 is the camera for you. I highly recommend you look into the X-H2 H2S variant. The X-H2 can also shoot ProRes RAW internally. It can also do 8K ProRes RAW and B-RAW with an external monitor. I also did a video comparison between the X-T5 image quality. Footage looks great when there's an ample amount of light, but when there's not much light and you pixel peep, you're going to find that the 40 megapixel sensor is going to have more noise than the X-H2S, obviously. If you want to see that video, I'll leave the link to it down in the description below. Just watch it after you finish watching this video. And while you're at it, make sure to subscribe to my channel please if you like if you're liking this video so far subscribe subscribe the xh2 also has one stop less of dynamic range than the xh2s as well and i find that color grading the flog 2 video files to be easy it's easy to pull highlights and shadows manipulate them without having them break down like uh, other video files that i've worked with such as 8-bit um, video files let's move on to the autofocusing <laughs> People want to know how is the autofocusing. It's a lot better than the previous generations. I didn't trust my X-T4 or my X-S10 as much as I do the X-H2 and the X-H2S. I would say the X-H2 is reliable. It's not going to track you quickly like the X-H2S, but it's reliable. You might miss a few shots here and there, but, but, and this is better than the previous generation cameras and you're going to come out with more keepers. I promise you that. I promise you that. <clears throat> I like pairing my X-H2 with the XF 33mm f1.4. The 33mm seems to work really well with these newer Fuji cameras. And I can't believe how many keepers there were. I honestly can't believe it because when it comes to portraits, I don't like shooting at a fast burst. For me, 5 to 8 frames per second is enough to get what I need. And I think having a new autofocusing system that gets me more shots in focus than previous gen models makes me 
forgive some of its missed focus shots. It's not perfect. It's not a perfect autofocusing system, but I would say it's reliable. It's reliable, it's trustworthy, and I'm having more fun knowing that I don't have to worry about the autofocusing like I did with the XS10. I'm able to be a bit more free and take more risks and move around a bit more and faster, being able to capture more moments because of the autofocusing system. And I don't have to confine myself into a single point autofocusing like I do with my XS10 and then move that single point to the eye and then point and shoot and try to get the eye in focus. This too, I feel is reliable now. I can just put it on and trust that it will get what I need. Your mileage may vary depending on the type of stuff you're photographing, but for me, taking portraits where everything has been one-on-one -on -one has been great for me. The one thing that, that does get this autofocusing very jittery and very excited is when there are too many people walking through the frame. Now, I've experienced this when I was trying to get some footage while I was in the city of London. I was filming the scene and you know, you got tourists and locals moving across the frame. And in that instant, what I saw from the back of the LCD screen was, the autofocusing just jumping everywhere. It was jumping from eye to eye, drawing different boxes on different people, just moving around. So it got a little confused uh, of who to track. So if you're someone that is filming like a wedding and you're trying to capture the entire scene, just turn off the face and eye detect if it's in a crowd or a group of people, the tracking just gets too excited. I also tested out the autofocusing tracking cars, which I find to be good. And, I, and as I was going through my shots, I was surprised by how many shots that were in focus. Mind you, I think this will depend on the lenses that you choose to get the right accuracy. I find with my 33 millimeter F1.4, tracking cars were really, really good, but then I would track cars with the XF 18 to, uh, to 120 millimeter F4, and I find that it does not keep up as well as the 33 millimeter. It does get a little bit lost uh, during the panning at the very last seconds. So you're, again, your mileage may vary depending on the lenses that you have. Oh my God, oh my God. Uh, itchy nose, itchy nose. And I find the newer lenses that came out a few years ago to work a lot better when it comes to uh, tracking and autofocusing. Also anything with a linear motor inside tends to be uh, better at autofocusing as well. So keep that in mind. And I've been getting a lot of questions uh, if the X-H2 autofocusing is good because there are reports coming out now that the X-T5 autofocusing sucks. Um, again, I don't know what you guys are shooting and what your situations are, but for me, what I do, portraits and traveling, I've been ha I've been quite satisfied because I came from the X-T2 days, so I know what shitty autofocusing looks like, okay? These new gen cameras are far from bad when it comes to autofocusing. But again, your mileage and experience may vary. The thing about YouTubers who are presenting these reports to you is they all have different needs and I guess you can say they have different threshold or tolerance to what is deemed as acceptable for an autofocusing system. So take what they present to you with a grain of salt, even me. <laughs> but instead of just being upset about something, just go outside and enjoy the camera for what it can do. I guarantee you'll have more fun if you do do that. <laughs> Can you imagine someone using a manual focusing lens and then complaining that it didn't have autofocusing? Like, <laughs> it doesn't make sense. Now the build of this camera is great. I love the size and the hand grip. I love the EVF and the back LCD screen. I don't like the top display where there used to be a dial. Uh, I would prefer that thing to be a dial, but that's just me. Everything about the, the way the camera looks and how it handles is great. There are just some button placement that I'm not a fan of, like having an ISO button on top of the camera. I find that's a strange place to put the uh, ISO button. What I did was I remapped one of the directional pad, the, the right D-pad, to be the new ISO button. And that is so I can match with the, my Sony a7IV just for uniformity. And again, I don't want to repeat myself when it comes to build quality because it's the same camera shell as the X-H2S, which I did do a review on. So if you guys want to hear more about that build quality, build quality, you can watch that side review in further detail. And I'll leave the links to that down in the description below. I will say this though, the weather ceiling on the X-H2S H2 is really good. So in London, it just piss poured rain on me while I, was, while I was exploring the city streets. So I had this camera out while I was shooting the moody scene. And again, I had no issues. The weather resistant worked. So good job, Fuji. I was shooting, I was photographing cars, driving around, driving in the rain, pouring rain. And I was just letting it fly, baby. And it was great. It held up great. Nothing happened to it. Everything's all good. Let's move on to the negatives. 
Uh, the rolling shutter is there, although it's not as bad as the Sony's. It's still there, so just be mindful of whipping your cameras around with quick movements. There's one restriction by Fujifilm. Let's just say you're in one of your photo, your custom photo setting, right? Like the C1s or the C2s right here. For the C1s to C2, C3s, I like to put a different film recipe on that dial, right? On those custom settings. And let's just say I wanna do a quick video with like the, the film recipe, right? I would have to uh, press this record button and then the camera will start, uh, start filming the footage in that film recipe color profile. But there's a caveat. I don't have any control over the ISO, the shutter speed or the aperture and I find this very, very annoying. I would like Fujifilm to unlock this part because this is a professional camera and as such, we should be given full autonomy over the camera. Sometimes I don't need to shoot an F-Log2 and grade the footage. Sometimes I would want to use one of the baked in look from these film recipes I've got um, as my custom settings. I also wanna do the 180 degree shutter angle, shutter angle rule so that I get that motion blur in order to have a cinematic looking footage. And I just can't do that because when you press the record button, Fujifilm takes those controls away for you for whatever reason. So this is, uh, we are now on custom settings one and that is my face right there. Holy shit, you can see my face. Hi, hi. And as I press the record button, everything's changed. I don't get, I can't change the shutter speed. I can't change the ISO button. Look, look at my ISO. I can't change anything like that. Right? The Fujifilm, if you're listening, we're professionals here. Uh, we know what we're doing when we're handling this camera. So you're making it hard for me to love you long time. So in a firmware update, please remove this restriction. That would be so great. It just feels like you're just putting too many restrictions on this camera for a, a camera that is geared towards the professionals. That give us an option to put it in auto or to have full manual control over that. That would be great, thank you. Otherwise, I'm switching to Sony or Panasonic. Have you guys seen the S5 Mark II? Jeez, that looks like such a dope camera. But another gripe that I have is the fact that they've removed the battery charger from us. You have to buy it separately, otherwise you are stuck with charging the battery through the camera uh, via USB-C. Because I don't like the fact that this is something we have to pay extra for. You know, I would understand if it would have been done, if this was done to the X-T5, maybe the X-Pro4 whenever it's coming out, or the X-S20 whenever that's coming out. This is one of your flagship cameras, and I feel that this should have been included with the price point. So that would have been nice. I would have been less annoyed. <laughs> I enjoy shooting with this camera a lot. While the X-H2S had growing pains because it was a new camera with new button, new buttons, new dials, everything about it didn't feel like the Fuji camera that I know. But because of the Fujifilm X-H2S, I knew what I've gotten myself into with the X-H2. I was prepared this time around and I knew what to do with this camera. So the growing pains was not here in this camera. And because of that, I find myself enjoying this camera a lot more. The quirks are still there, obviously, uh, but for the most part, I'm having fun with this camera. I love the images I've been getting. The colors just look so much better on this camera, in my opinion. I don't know if it's just me, it's a placebo effect, or it's just like, the honeymoon phase or whatever, but I'm loving the photos I'm getting with this camera. What are your thoughts on this camera? Do you have this camera? Do you love this camera? Do you hate this camera? Leave your comments down below. And if you're interested in this uh, Fujifilm X-H2, I'll leave the links down below. And if you find this video helpful, do me a favor guys and subscribe to my channel. I got more Fujifilm and photography related content coming your way. And as always, my name is Tung and I'll see you in the next video. I love you. Goodbye.